The elders of the Pruitt and Lobick congregation welcome you to this series of lectures on the Apostles' Doctrine and Fellowship. It is our hope and prayer that the lessons these five men bring will be edifying and upbuilding to the flock over which the Lord has charged our responsibility. As did Cornelius, we've encouraged the members of this congregation to invite friends and relatives from far and near to come and learn from this series of lessons from God's Word. As the morals of society around us have declined, it has had an effect on the Lord's Church. In many places, clear and pointed preaching has given way to soft teaching and preaching that neglects specific application to sins of the individual Christian. The result is an increasing moral looseness among God's people which has not been seen in past generations. It is our intent that the sermons presented will show the clear and unmistakable difference between the entirety of what the Bible says and the unbalanced practice of avoiding things of a negative nature. The men participating in this lectureship have been encouraged to make plain and pointed applications but avoid that which may be construed as personal attacks towards men or congregations. Please compare the things presented with what you read in the Bible so each one may benefit from this lectureship. And now speaking, Larry Hayfley, The Elastic Gospel and Romans 14. Do in making the announcements is to make mention of who our speaker is tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight I want to talk to you about some very sober and serious and solemn things that have to do with the word of life and the hope of life itself. Before we get into that discussion proper, I want to remind you that we are representatives of and members of and partners of and sharers of the most divisive thing that has ever entered the earth. And I'm talking about the gospel of the Son of God. When Jesus the Christ came to the earth, he proclaimed to those that were round about him, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. The world had never seen anything so narrow and so divisive, so exclusionary as the gospel of the Son of God. Jesus said, except ye believe that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. Jesus said, if you don't believe that I am the promised Messiah, where I am, there you cannot come. My friends, we are a part of, and we're recipients of, and we're benefactors of, the most narrow, exclusionary thing that has ever entered into the earth. Jesus, the Son of God, said, Think not, Matthew 10 and verse 34, that I've come to bring peace upon the earth. He said, I, I didn't come to send peace. I didn't come, Matthew 10, 34, to send peace but a sword. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father and the daughter against her mother-in-law and the daughter-in-law against, daughter against her mother-in-law and a man's foes shall be they of his own household. My friend, there was nothing any more divisive than Jesus the Christ and the message that he came to proclaim. Jesus said, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. Many there be which go in thereat, but he said, Straight is the gate, and narrow is the way that leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. There was never anything more divisive than the gospel of the Son of God. In Acts 9 and verse 26, the apostles picked up that same fervor and flavor when Demetrius protested before a meeting, an amalgamation, a confederation of the silversmith, and he was dismayed at this apostle who proclaimed that there are no gods that are made with hands. 
There just aren't any. They are just of no validity. They're of no authenticity. They're of no veracity. That's what Paul proclaimed. My friends, if you have obeyed the gospel, you have taken a part of and a portion in the most narrow and exclusionary thing that has ever entered the earth. Now then, in first, in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul in verse 15, as he talked about the gospel, said that we are the Savior of Christ in them that are saved and them that perish. Now then look at 2 Corinthians 2.16. He said to some, we are the aroma, we are the savor, we are the flavor, if you will, of death unto death. And to others, we are the savor of life unto life. Now to some that are dead in sin, we tell them they're going to die in that sin. To those that live in the flesh, we tell them there is life in the spirit. But then notice what is the bottom of that, right underneath verse 16. The apostle said, we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, that is, but as of God in the sight of God, speak we in Christ. And so the apostle said that he spoke not as corrupting the word of God. And I want you to notice that this word of God is an aroma of death to some. And it is an aroma of life to some. But Paul said, we do not corrupt it, we do not corrode it. But rather, we speak the word of God in its purity and in its sincerity. And the apostles so preached in 1 Timothy 1.3. Paul said, as I besought thee to abide still in Ephesus, when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. Now my friends, that was narrow, wasn't it? That was exclusive, wasn't it? I don't want you to tell them about other doctrines. Paul said, I want you to tell them to teach no other doctrine. My friend, that is a narrow thing. Now tonight, what we're going to talk about are some things that are going to have to do with that which is narrow. But secondly, notice by way of introduction, something may be said about attitude. And I want you to notice that one may have a bad attitude, Philippians 1.16. He may have, Philippians 1.16, a bad attitude, but he may preach the truth. Paul mentioned some in Philippians 1.16 that preach Christ. They did it out of contention and not sincerely. But Paul said they did indeed preach Christ with a bad attitude. But I read about a man that had a good attitude that opposed Christ. In Acts 23, 1, he said, I've lived before God in all good conscience until this day. In Acts 26, 9, that man said, I verily thought with myself I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Now here was a man of a good conscience, a clean and a cure con clear conscience, but here was a man with a sincere attitude that opposed the Son of God. And there are those that with a bad attitude preach Christ. And then some will say, well, now here's the thing that I don't like about this panel of men and about you brethren and about different ones of you, and it has been said of Larry Hayfley that these men love trouble, that they love division, and that they love strife. Then why do they then preach unity? Why do they then preach unity? And why do they preach the things that will bring unity? Now I want you to think about this. If it is true, suppose it is true, that I love division, that I love strife, that I love trouble, tribulation, trial, and turmoil. Suppose that is the truth. Will Romans 14 cover it? Will it cover my attitude? Now think about this. Here's another fact. And I want you to let this sink in. There is a good man, a beloved man, and a lovely man of sterling quality and character that I could never approach to, who has a wonderful reverence and respect for the things of God Almighty. But he is preaching error on marriage, divorce, and remarriage. And so we justify him. We say he is to be received. He can come and be a part of our work and our worship and of our fellowship and our association. Now, he preaches error, but he has a good attitude about it. But some of you fellas have a bad attitude and you preach the truth, we can't have anything to do with you. Now I want you to just look at that, please. 
If I've got a great attitude and I preach error and you acknowledge it is error, but the fellow's such a lovely person, we can accept him. But you fellows have a terribly bad, divisive attitude, though we acknowledge you're preaching the truth, but we can't have anything to do with you. Now reason that out. Just think about that. That's really where a lot of folks are and haven't thought about it. But just think about it now. Listen, if things like Romans 14, if Romans 14 will allow a person who preaches what will result in adulterous marriages, if that will allow him to be in God's favor and in our fellowship, if Romans 14 will cover his error and allow him still to be in God's favor and fellowship, why won't I, when I preach the truth on those things, why won't Romans 14 cover me if I have a lousy attitude when I'm preaching the truth? So just remember that. Just think about that. That works both ways, folks. Works both ways. Then, what about this church? What is the point and the purpose of this church? Trying to make a name for itself. Well, I read about churches that have a name, and some of them have a sorry one. Revelation 3.1, Thou hast a name that thou livest, but art dead. The Lord said, I know your real name. And he said, you are a dead church. But now this, this activity this week is not to glorify man, these elders of this church. But in 2 Corinthians 9.2, now listen brethren, the Apostle Paul commended the church at Achaia, namely Corinth, and he said, your zeal hath provoked very many. He talked about their zeal to do this good work, and he said, your zeal hath provoked very many. Paul used them as an example. Somebody said, well, you're trying to control the brotherhood with your policies, with your plans, with your programs, and with your procedures. That's a lie. That isn't the truth. And the man that says it is not telling the truth and hasn't talked to anybody here about that and doesn't know anything about the work, for if he did, he wouldn't say it. But another thing let me say about this. In 1 Thessalonians 1 and verse 8, the book of God says, For from you, that is the Thessalonians, sounded out the word of the Lord. Now get this. Look at the text. From you, the Thessalonians, sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia, that's local, and Achaia, that's the region, 300 miles to the south, that's regionally, but in also in every place, your faith to God were to spread abroad. So locally in Macedonia, regionally in Achaia, and in every place internationally, the word of God has been sounded out. And that's all that these elders and these brethren and this church is trying to do. And by the grace of God Almighty, that's what we're going to do. And the snipes and the carping criticism of the world and of enemies of the gospel can just have their field day. We are determined to do that, and that's the course we're going to pursue, and that we're going to hold on to, we're going to cling to, we're going to cleave to, until we're shown that we're teaching and preaching error. But then, let me say this. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 14, the Apostle Paul pointed to churches that set a good example. And he said, Ye brethren became followers of the churches of God, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. He said, you became followers of them. And he commended them for their following that which was right and proper and true. And so when we do that in accord with God's truth, not following men or any church of men or any eldership, but following those that follow Christ, then we're doing the thing that God Almighty himself commends. But our study tonight then is a study of the elastic gospel. There is an elastic and a plastic gospel. Now just what is the elastic gospel? There are those that say, well, you know, I'm not sure what you mean when you talk about the elastic gospel. Folks, I'm talking about the elastic gospel is the old-fashioned, nothing but plain old, pure, simple denominationalism. It is the very thing, this right here, is the very prescription for denominationalism. Before we go to the next chart, I want you to notice something. Now remember this. You thought that Carl Ketcher's side or some of our modern brethren in churches of Christ invented this. Oh no, friends. Unity in perversity, unity in diversity was invented a long, long time ago. It's how that the Baptists and the Methodists can have an Easter sunrise service at one time during the year and then spit at each other the rest of the year. That's, how, that's what you got when you got unity in diversity. It's the doctrine that says that the Jesus-only folks who believe Jesus is the Father, is the Son, is the Holy Spirit, 
can deny everybody but then accept the Trinitarian Pentecostals and warm up to them when they're talking to a Campbellite about Holy Ghost baptism. Unity and diversity is the very bedrock foundation of denominationalism. Now if you don't think it's so, I want you to notice here what we have illustrated and demonstrated on the next series of charts. I want you to look at unity and diversity. It's the very heart of denominationalism. Now brethren, isn't it true, not because we've said it, but that Bible unity is based upon what the Bible says. When we're talking about water baptism, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. B baptism for the remission of sins into the water, out of the water, buried within in baptism. And we've said, friends, we can have Bible unity on the basis of what the Word of God says. Is there anybody here that doesn't understand that? My friends, that's the old Bible appeal. But denominationalism says, unity and diversity says, well, there's some of us that believe you're saved before you're baptized. Some of us believe you can be sprinkled instead of buried. Some of us believe you can baptize an infant instead of men and women, Acts 8, 12. Well, unity and diversity says, let's have it all. No, friends, we can't have it all. Bible truth says, no other doctrine, the form of sound words, no other gospel, and those that don't remain in the doctrine of Christ have not God, not to think of men above that which is written. In the Lord's Supper, we take the communion of the body and blood of the Lord, and we do that upon the first day of the week. Now, there are those that want to do it monthly without a single verse of Scripture. There are even some brethren that are taking it on Tuesdays, some brethren in churches of Christ that are advocating today, we take the Lord's Supper. Well, you say, what about that? You any diversity? Are you ready for it, brethren? Catholics have said for years, the way for only, though they're weakening on that. Well, could we add Coca-Cola? Unity and diversity would say, oh yeah. But what's been our appeal? Not that it makes it right or wrong, but our appeal has always been to the book of God. Let's just do what the Bible says. And that's Bible truth and Bible unity. Now then, next notice. The same thing illustrated and demonstrated in singing. All we've ever said to people is, sing and make melody in your heart. Not on your heart, but in your heart. And we've said this is what the book of God says. Sing. There are those that want humming. Yes, humming in worship. You hadn't heard about that? In October of 1989, there was a church in a conservative group of Christians. And if I told you the preacher's name, you'd recognize him instantly. I'm not talking about a wild-eyed liberal church, but I'm talking about a conservative church, anti-institutional, where they had humming in worship and it was defended. You said, Larry, you better reveal that preacher. You better tell who he is. Are you against calling names? Because I'm going to tell you, you know who the preacher was at that conservative church where they had humming in worship? You want to know? It is Larry Hayfley. That's right. Where I was, where I lived, we had humming and worship and it was defended. The next Sunday morning, I hummed in my little tomb for about an hour. <laughs> and they thought I was off key and I want to tell you for another hour, for another hour, they defended publicly and it's on tape, humming in worship. Let me ask you, brethren, should I have Romans 14 them? Huh? Come on. Somebody stand up and tell me. Now, after you get past my sorry, sick, sad attitude, will you tell me? If I suddenly become sweet, will you say, will you say that we ought to use Romans 14 and bring in the hummy? Will you? No. No takers. No takers. But see, we're mighty bold and mighty belligerent. But now when we got a time, a chance to Romans 14 ourselves in the summer, are we going to do it? Now folks, you say, well, Larry, you're just being intimidating. You're just trying to browbeat whatever it takes. I'm telling you, this is serious, folks. This is serious. We've stroked and we've begged and we've pleaded. We've cajoled and we've tried to persuade, but we're trying to tell you something, folks. Are you ready? This is denominationalism. And unity and diversity says, except man's diversity. But here's all we've ever played for up on the first day of the week. Now, by the way, those same people wanted humming and worship. 
said that 1 Corinthians 16 2 was just a convenience. We didn't have to take the Lord, it didn't have to lay by in store on the Lord's day. We could lay by in store any day, every day. That wasn't a pattern. And when we bind it, we turn people off and drive people away. Now that was their idea. What do you say, brethren? You ready for it? You see, that's where unity and perversity, that's where unity and diversity goes. Next, we've always said elders in every church. Now when I say we, I mean the Bible says, Acts 14, 23, attend the flock of God that's among you. We know their qualifications. Shall we have denominationalism with a bachelor preacher, with a one-man pastor, with a 19-year-old with no wife or children as a Mormon elder, or even a pope? No. Well, that's man's diversity. You ready for that? You say no. Well, that's what we're saying. We always present the Bible. Stand with the Bible. How about the work of the church? Sounding out the work of the Lord. Sending men to preach the gospel. Do we, do we include fun and food and frolic in a gymnasium? No, my friends, that is not the work and the worship of the New Testament church. Fun and food and frolic belongs to the social, recreational, entertainment category and class of some government agency or a function of the home. But Jesus, listen, the Son of God did not die to purchase a YMCA. Now that's what we've always said, isn't that right? And that doesn't make it right, but isn't that the truth? In Romans 14, another hills of square. We've just said stick with the Bible, haven't we? And that's been the approach. That's been the appeal, my friends. And then in areas of morals, in modest apparel, denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, live soberly, righteously, and godly. Evil companionships corrupt good morals. Well, brethren, should we Romans 14 ourselves in homosexuality, abortion, social drink, and by the way, the brethren who wanted humming and weren't careful about laying by in store on the first day of the week said that a social drink was all right too. It was all right too. You could socially drink. In fact, one of the leaders said that he could go to the beach with his girlfriend in a bikini with a bucket of beer and not sin. I told that to one brother and he said he's a better man than I am. <laughs> It's not to be made light of, but the point is, this is where unity and diversity goes. Shall we have it? Our worship in spirit and in truth, the commandments of men make worship void in vain. We learn that from Nadab and Abihu and by faith Abel. We learn that. Do we accept Christmas and Easter and beads and lighting of candles? That's unity in, in diversity. That says we know what the Bible says, but we're going to allow this just so we can all have unity. Folks, listen. It is the spirit, the heart, the anchor of religious denominationalism. Next. Now, somebody said, no, Larry, we don't want that. But here's what we do want. We know what the Bible says. Marriage is to be held in honor by all and the bed undefiled. And whosoever put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery. And whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whoso marrieth her which is put away, doth commit adultery. We know what the Bible says. Here's the old Bible plan. But we've got a nice group of brethren that are not certain today whether or not a homosexual ought to be wed. You say, Larry, there's nobody like that. Yet. There's some down here on aliens not accountable. Shall we diversify them into unity? You say, but Larry, all we want is if the mate departs or the guilty one may remarry. Now we're not going into any fat polygamy and homosexual stuff or divorce for any cause, but we, we just want to squeeze in some of our brothers that kind of believe that if you've been married three or four times uh, before you obey the gospel, you can keep that fourth wife, obey the gospel, and still be a faithful member of the Lord's church. We want to bring that in. All right. If that's so, what are you going to say when your children say, I got two friends of mine. John and Bob, they want to get married. Daddy, would you do the ceremony? 
What about it? Now, folks, we're not ready for the rest of that. Are you ready for this? Now, let me tell you something. The instant you go defending this and say, well, we can allow the differences here and we can still have our fellowship in the gospel despite all of this, listen. Your children are going to go back to those other charts and say, well, mate, you know, that hunting's not so bad. See where it's going, folks? All right, let's get back. Now, some say, well, what is the elastic gospel? Well, the elastic gospel, folks and friends, is simply this. Some say we can no more think alike than we can look alike. Hey, isn't that cute? Somebody said he was glad it was so because he'd seen Larry Hayfield. He was glad that, you know, that we couldn't look alike. And, and so the, the idea is, you know, we can't think alike. And so since we, you know, we can no more think alike than we can look alike. And so what does that allow? Oh, that, that's, that's the elastic gospel, see? Because since we can't look alike, we can't think alike. Sure wish somebody told Paul before he wrote 1 Corinthians 1.10. Seat you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, you all speak the same thing. There be no division among you, be perfectly joined together, the same mind, the same judgment. Sure, with somebody to inform Paul. But how far do we go in this? We can no more think alike than we can look alike. Now that's an old Carl Ketcher size cutism, but it's been resurrected. Now listen, brethren, listen to me. You say, well, this is on marriage and divorce. Suppose I don't want to leave it there. Suppose I want to apply it to the virgin birth. Suppose I want to apply this to homosexuality. <coughs> Suppose some brother comes in and says, I've got a dear friend in Africa with three wives all at once. We can no more think alike, we can look alike, that justify polygamy? What are you going to say to that argument then? Next. Somebody said, well, you know what? Romans 14 allows us to disagree. And so that's why that we have this elasticity. That's how we have it. Romans 14 allows it. Well, let's take a look at that. Brother Moses Lard said in his thoughts on Romans 14, he said these thoughts are his own, that is the person that's under discussion in Romans 14, are his own private opinion respecting or concerning things about which there is no command. He, therefore, has the right to hold them without interference from others. The things which his thoughts respect are in themselves indifferent, and therefore, the thoughts which relate to them are indifferent. Consequently, so long as the thoughts do not lead him who holds them into wrong, he is not to be disturbed in them. Now I realize Moses Lord doesn't establish the truth. But I'm simply saying that he's not the only one that has set forth the view that Brother Robert set forth last night Then it shall be set forth here. Then further we notice. Romans 14. What's it talking about? Well, R.L. Whiteside said that Romans 14 is talking about matter of opinion or indifference. He says the chapter must be confined to such matters, what matters? Of opinion or indifference. That it involves opinions and personal rights. But the A.W. Dicus said in this chapter, Romans 14, Paul deals with things or matters that are indifferent within themselves. And so this has generally been the view, it doesn't establish the truth, but that Paul is talking about in Romans 14 of uh, things that are indifferent within themselves. But now, in the past five years, there's come a different view. And this view has been espoused by Brother Ed Harrell in a 17-part series that ran uh, nearly a year and a half in which he said that Romans 14 covers error taught regarding divorce and remarriage. He said that Romans 14 covers error in matters of faith. He said that Romans 14 covers error of considerable moral and doctrinal import. He said that Romans 14 tolerates contradictory teachings and practices on important moral and doctrinal questions. 
Now you'll notice the difference between those statements, not that one establishes truth and the other doesn't, but the difference between this view and those that have just been purported, those that have just been propounded before you. But I want you, before we go much further, to notice this. Before you turn that on, Norris, think about this, folks. Whenever you talk about Romans 14, you know how we talk about it? We talk about Romans 14 like it was the 28th book of the New Testament. I mean, we refer to Romans 14 almost as though it's an isolated entity out there. But folks, Romans 14 is a chapter in a book. It is not in a little world of its own. It's not just a little vacuum out here where God puts some things that just don't seem to fit. Now notice, please, where does Romans 14 fit? The ink on Paul's pen was not dry when he started chapter 14. The last two verses of chapter 13 say, Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering. And I dare you to look up that word without getting embarrassed. Chambering. That's rooms. Room to room. Wantonness. That's the lascivious activity that's involved in these rooms. And the writer says, don't walk in that way, not in strife and envying, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ. Make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Folks, Romans 14, right before it begins, says, these things are denied. Paul doesn't say, don't walk in these things, but if you do, we got a way out for you. No. And right after, somebody said, well, we can differ on our doctrinal views. Well, right after he wrote Romans chapter 14, he said, now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned and avoid them. Now the next time you go to Romans 14 to try to justify sin and ungodliness, just remember that Romans 14 is part of a sandwich, if you will. And here's one slice of bread, Romans 13, 13, and 14, and here's the bottom slice. See that? And we act like we forget that Romans 14, we just go to Romans 14, act like the rest of the Bible evidently doesn't exist. No, friend. It is not a separate living entity of itself. But it has context. All right? Now in Romans 14 and verse 1, Paul said, Him that is weak in the faith, receive ye. Who is this weak one? Folks, listen. He wasn't weak in concern. He wasn't weak in conviction. He wasn't weak in commitment. He was weak in conscience. Now this weak brother wasn't one that just attended services once a week. W-E-E-K. He wasn't a fellow that, you know, that just was weak and a very weak Christian, a nominal Christian. No. What was he weak in? He was weak in the fact that he was not certain about these things or had a, had a view or an opinion about certain things, a commitment about certain things that was very strong. But he was weak in not being able to believe that he could partake or that he could uh, uh, not fail to observe a certain day. He was weak in conscience. Now, if Romans 14 justifies, shall we say, him that is weak in the faith namely on marriage, divorce, and remarriage, receive ye. And by the way, you say, well, I know a preacher that's preaching error on these things. He's preaching error on these things. We can receive him. Listen, what if a couple comes to the congregation where that fellow's preaching and says, now, this preacher you've got here preaches a view on divorce and remarriage that we're living. Could you fellowship those that live, watch this, what this preacher whom you accept preaches? In other words, could I practice what your preacher preaches? Would you accept it? Now just suppose the weak one practices these things. May we receive him? If not, then Romans 14 isn't talking about these items. Next. 
One man esteemeth one day above another. Another esteemeth every day alike. Paul said, let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. Now whatever Romans 14 is talking about. Can it be talking about an adulterous marriage? One man esteemeth one marriage alike and one man said this. Can we esteem every marriage and say let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind about every marital situation? Is it up to each one to determine whether adultery is right? Is it? Now think about that. Is it up to us to determine? May we just decide whether or not drinking or homosexuality? May we decide whether these things are right? Now, back yonder, let us just suppose that someone is converted from a Seventh-day Adventist church today. And they've kept the Sabbath Saturday. They've not gone to ball games on Saturday. And they can't get that out of their mind. Now they're converted to Christ and they understand the truth. But they just don't believe they ought to watch ball games on Saturday. Is it alright for that person to avoid ball games and to study his Bible and to pray and go visit the sick on Saturday as a New Testament Christian? Is that alright for them to do that? Why, of course it is. Of course it is. And can we say then that because of that judgment, can we say that then we can take Romans 14 and apply it in these other areas? No, folks. No, it doesn't apply there. Next. He that regardeth the day regardeth it unto the Lord. So here's a fellow that says, I'm going to set aside that Saturday for Bible study and prayer. And Paul said, He that regardeth not the day, he that goes to the ball game, to the Lord he doth not regard it. And then here's a fellow that eats meat, and here's a fellow that's a vegetarian. For he eateth and God, giveth God thanks, he that eateth not to the Lord, he eateth not and giveth God thanks. Now, there are Indians today, over in India, I speak of, who don't eat cows, don't eat beef. Suppose we convert one of them. And conscientiously, he just can't eat that meat. Or a Jew is converted, he's never had a ham sandwich in his life. Can he continue to stay away from ham sandwiches? Can he continue to refuse that sandwich? Surely he can. Certainly he can. And Paul said, that's up to him. And if one regards it, he regards it to the Lord. Can we say that about homosexuality? No. Paul said, I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing, no hog meat, no cow meat, nothing unclean of itself, but to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. Now folks, we understand what Paul is talking about here. And if I'm a vegetarian and I say that I just don't think I ought to eat... When I was in the Philippines, I wouldn't eat their roast dog. I found it awful hard to pet Rover and then pray over it. <laughs> it was hard to do. Well, I'm not putting anybody down like that, you see. But now the Apostle says, there's nothing unclean of itself. But if a fellow esteems that ham to be unclean, that hog, that swine, he's not to eat that, then he ought not to eat it. Should we say, I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that no marriage is unclean of itself? No, folks. It will not work. Further. Paul said, for meat or for food, destroy not the work of God. That is, the, your fellow Christian. That's the work of God. All things indeed are pure. It's alright to eat that hog meat. All things are pure. But it is evil for the man who eateth with offense, whose conscience is weak in those areas. Now that's what Paul is talking about. But was he saying when he said all things are pure, was he talking about all marital relationships, all worship, all social things? No, folks. 
No, those things are not pure. They are the works of the flesh. Not works of the faith, but works of the flesh. I believe you can see that further. In Romans 14, there are those that Paul says, Receive ye. God hath received him. God makes the man to stand. He is not, you're not to condemn him. He is not unclean. And he, those that serve God in these things are acceptable unto God. And all things are pure. But now notice in 1 Corinthians 5, here's a brother that had his father's wife. What did Paul say? Well, it's terrible, awful, bad, brethren, but we ought to turn him over to Romans 14. No. Paul said such an one ought to be taken away. Delivered to Satan. Purge out that leaven. I've already judged him. That wicked person, he's wicked, not unclean. He is to be rejected, put away. He is not acceptable. He is wicked. Such wickedness, such fornication that the Gentiles know not of. Put away that wicked person. As opposed to Romans 14, talking about things that are pure. No, folks. You cannot use or misuse Romans chapter 14 to bring in that which is immoral and contrary to God's plan and God's pattern of righteous and godly living. It just won't stand the test. Next. Somebody said, but, but look, one passage says, Romans 14, receive ye. 2 John 9 to 11 says, the man comes bringing not this doctrine, receive him not. Well, what's the difference? Well, just briefly, it is this. Paul spoke of some in Galatians that were observing days and times and years, and he said, I'm afraid of you, lest I bestowed upon you labor in vain. But as Galatians 2.16 and Galatians 2.21 and Galatians 1.6 shows, and Galatians 5, 1 to 4 shows in context, they were doing this to obtain righteousness. Now then, Paul said when they do these things, they observe these things to obtain righteousness by the law, receive them not. But if a man for conscience sake, after he's become a child of God, he is a child of God, but he still believes that that day he ought to keep set aside as a day that is not to be engaged in fraternization and travel and sports and fun, then that is up to that man. And you allow him to maintain that within himself, and don't you all judge or condemn one another. Now that's allowable. But it is not allowable when I start saying, that these days must be observed under pain and penalty of eternal damnation. In 1 Timothy 4, Paul said, Some will depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits. And he said in verse 3, Forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats or foods. Now here were commands that they were saying abstain from foods that God had created to be received with thanksgiving. Well, you don't have that right. But if, conscientiously, you cannot eat or decide to be a vegetarian or cannot eat a certain food within your own self, that is up to you. That's your prerogative and that is your privilege. But it is not your prerogative to forbid and command that others so do under pain and penalty of eternal damnation. Now with regard to marriage, some will forbid to marry. Catholicism comes to mind and their priestly order. Now then, we don't have that right. Marriage is to be held in honor by all. But yet, if I decide, Matthew 19.10, not to marry, if I decide not to marry for the kingdom of heaven's sake, or as Paul said, I could wish you all were like myself, is that my prerogative? Can I decide never to marry? Surely I can. And you could receive me. We could receive one another. But I cannot go out here and say, if you want to be holy before God, don't get married or you're unholy. Now, with regard to circumcision, Paul took Timothy and had him circumcised. 
And you might compare 1 Corinthians 9, verses 19 to 23. Paul says to them that were under the law, I became as under the law, to them without law, that by all means, he said, I became as without the law, by all means I might save some. So he knew if Timothy's influence would be harmed and hindered, and he took Timothy and had him circumcised because of the Jews in those parts. Now, when brethren though came in and said, except you be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved, Paul said, whoa, whoa, we withstood them to the face, gave place by subjection to them, no, not for an hour. See the difference? All right, further. Some people say, well, the elastic gospel today, they say, well, our fellowship, our membership is in an organism. Now listen to this, folks. It's in an organism, not in an organization or institution. Now that sounds real holy and pious. They say, now listen, here's what they'll tell you. Well, now, you folks in the Church of Christ, you condemn for elders and deacons and saints, and you've got your organi organizational structure, and you're here, believe, repent, confess, be baptized, singing, giving, praying, prayer, preaching. You've got all that organizational structure. But they say, oh, now we've really come to call men back to a living organism, to a body, not to some right organization or institution. Now, that sounds real pious and holy. Folks, I want, I want to ask you something. Do you know of any creature from amoeba, paramecium to man, any, listen, any living organism that doesn't also have organization? Think about that. Now, your body is a living organism. A paramecium is a living organism. But what do you learn about when you learn about them in school? Protoplasm, cytoplasm, cell nucleus. Do you learn about those things? Sure, they are living organisms, but what do all organisms have? Organization. Yes, this body is a living organism, but it has organization, nervous system, reproductive system, digestive system, respiratory system. It is a living organism that has an organization. And it's true of the body of our Lord. Now I want to run this by you too. What you think about this? Now remember what they're saying now. They're saying, well, you folks in the Church of Christ, you're just trying to make everything organizationally right. Dot all the I's, cross all the T's. That turns folks off. Some of our brethren are saying that. We need to get away from that. And we need to talk about our Lord as an organism, not an organization. Well, let's just think about that. Suppose you've got two germs out here. These germs are floating and flying around. And this one germ says, I sure would like to have the nourishment from Larry Hayford. I sure would like to have that nourishment from Larry Hayfley. They're out there floating around. And the other germ says, Well, Dunning, if you want that nourishment from Larry Hayfley, you're going to have to do what? You're going to have to get into his body. See that? If that germ is ever, listen, if that germ is ever going to get any nourishment from the organism, that is Larry Hayfley, he's going to have to get into what? The organizational arrangement that is his body. Now that's so, folks, of the church of our Lord. Let's see it. Some say, well, we need more preaching about that grace in Christ, less about the church and baptism. Paul went down and preached Christ. And what did he, what had he been preaching? The things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ. Philip preached Christ to the eunuch, and he learned to be baptized from the preaching of Christ. Billy Graham says he preaches Christ Monday through Friday on TV. He says he preaches Christ in a crusade and says not a word about baptism. But in one chariot ride, Philip preached Christ, and the man said, the very next verse, what doth hinder me to be baptized? And into that organizational body. 
This man, this jailer at Philippi said, What must I do to be saved? They said, Believe on the Lord. And they spoke to him the word of the Lord. The very next verse says, He was baptized. Then later we read about what? The church at Philippi. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 2, I preach nothing but Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I declared the gospel, the death, the burial, the resurrection of the Son of God. And when they heard nothing but Jesus Christ and Him crucified, many of the Corinthians hearing, believed, and were baptized. And every one of them, 113, was baptized. And they were baptized into one body or the church. After Paul preached what? Nothing but Jesus and Him crucified. So all of you brethren that want to tell us how better to preach the gospel, to preach Christ without preaching a legalistic, pharisaical, narrow-minded, exclusionary gospel without water baptism, if you know better than the apostles, my friend, you're too smart. And that's just the truth of it. Because here's an apostle, the Son of God, said, I preach nothing. But Christ and Him crucified, and when He did, men were baptized into one body. Look at Acts 20, 24. Paul said he preached what to the Ephesians? He said, none of these things move me. I might finish my course with joy in the ministry I received the Lord Jesus. Listen, to testify of the gospel of the grace of God. Paul, what did you preach in Ephesus? The gospel of the grace of God. But the gospel of the grace of God included repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. It included preaching the kingdom of God, which is the church, Matthew 16, 18, and 19. And the Ephesians were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, Acts 19, 5, for the remission of sins, Acts 2, 38. And that is the preaching of the grace of God in the body of Christ. Let's go on. Now get it, please. The Bible says God was in Christ, reconciling the world in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, 19. But we're reconciled unto God where? In one body. The Bible says by one spirit we're all baptized into one body. The Bible says we're baptized into Christ. Well, what's the truth? The truth is, folks, when we're baptized into Christ, we're baptized into His body. Listen, remember those two germs? Remember? One germ says, I want that nourishment. The other germ says, you got to get in that body. Now folks, if you want the nourishment that is in Christ, you're going to have to get into Christ. How do you do that? You get into His body. What is His body? It's the church. It's the church. And I don't care how you sneak up on people. You Someday you're going to have to sit down and you're going to tell somebody that. Or you'll live and die a Methodist. Someday you're going to have to get busy and tell him that. Maybe you know somebody that's a lot sweeter and a lot nicer and tell him a whole lot better than I can, then call him up. But somebody's going to have to flat tell that old boy. That's so. All right. Now, just think about it, folks. The Bible says we've been blessed with all spiritual blessings and heavenly places in Christ. Be strong in the grace that's in Christ. Salvation and eternal glory is in Christ. This is the record that God has given us eternal life. His life is in His Son. In whom in Christ we have redemption, even the forgiveness of sins. He had made Him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. The love of God that's in Christ Jesus. We're born again. And if a man is born again, he's a new creature. Where? In Christ. Peace is in me, Jesus said. Alright, all of that is in Jesus. But how does one get into Christ, the living organism, where these blessings are? How do you get into that organism where all these blessings are? You're baptized into Him. And someday, you've got to tell somebody that. Alright? And then, let's look down another one also. There are those who say, well, our faith today should be in a person. Now get this, please. Our faith today should be in a person, not a pattern. Salvation is in a Savior, not a system. Now basically, that's saying about the same thing. But the reason I'm running these by you folks 
is because they're things that I've heard and they're slicky. They sound good. They sound pious and religious and holy. Now listen to, listen to it. They say, you know, our faith should be in a person. But the trouble with folks like Tom Roberts and Ron Halbrook and, and, and Harry Osborne and Jerry Fight is that they're trying to tell us that, that we ought to have a pattern. Our faith's in a pattern, in a correct pattern, not in a perfect person. And you say, well, you know, that sounds pretty good. And then sometimes they'll say, well, our salvation's in a Savior, not a system. That sounds pretty good. You see, well, that's a lot of, a lot of merit to that. Now let's look, let's look. That's being said. There are those who say that the early Christians, they surrendered not to a plan of salvation, but to a Savior. And then when the Bible says we depart from the faith and all of that, we're not talking about commitment to a person, but to a body of teaching. Well now folks, listen. There is no way on this earth that that can be so. We surrender, they surrendered to the man when they surrendered to his plan. Now, I want you, before we get to this chart and look at it in detail, I want you to get your Bible. And I want you to open it to Hebrews 5. Get your Bible. And then go to Romans 6 with me. If it's possible, do those one by one. And that page, that chart right there. Yeah, that chart, just one by one. All right, now. Are you in Hebrews 5? Just cover up that first line even. Now the statement is that you know we ought to surrender to a save, obey a savior, a person, and not a pattern. Are you in Hebrews 5? Have you got Romans 6? Alright, now good. Now get it both. Romans 6, Hebrews 5. Alright, let's read, let's read Hebrews 5, 8, and 9. Now hold Romans 6. Though he were a son, yet learned the obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, listen, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Somebody said, see there, Larry, that's what we're saying. We need to obey the person. And you folks in the church of Christ, you folks in the narrow-minded, bigoted, pharisaical, legalistic church of Christ, why well, all you talk about is a pattern. We ought to obey the Son. We, have, we need a lead person to obey the person, the Christ, the Son, and not our right pattern that Alexander Campbell hewed out. You know, we got a pattern that we formed, that we humanly devised. That's a lie. But that's what it's said. And we need to do what Hebrews 5 says. Obey a person. Hold your finger right there. Flip to Romans 6. Now read this. I'm in verse 17. 6, 17, Romans. But God be thanked that ye were, past tense, the servants of sin. But, contrast to that, ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine. See the word form? Folks, it is the word for mold or pattern. You obeyed that form of doctrine which was delivered you, being then, when? Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. Now all this glittery, glitzy little past talk about, well, we need to focus on a person and not a pattern. It's a distinction the New Testament does not make. And my friend, there isn't any way on, her, on earth in any way under heaven that you can obey Him without obeying His pattern. No way. Now let's see that. What about the New Testament Jews? Look at Mark 8, 38. Jesus said, listen, Whosoever therefore, listen, shall be ashamed of me and my word in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. John 12, 48, listen. He that rejecteth me, the person, and receiveth not my word, hath one that judgeth him. 
It is the person and the pattern. The word that I've spoken, the same will judge you. John 8, 30. Those Jews that he spoke to believed on him. They did what? Somebody said, that's it, Larry. They believed on the person. They believed on Him. And that's what we got to do in the church today. we got to get folks believing on the person, on the Him, and not on some pattern that Alexander Campbell devised. No, keep reading. Then said Jesus, verse 31, to those Jews that believed on Him, if you continue in My Word, if you do what? If you continue in My Word, then are you My disciples indeed, listen, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And that's the only way you can be made free by the person is to obey the truth. And my friend, that will stand when the world is on fire. Next. Somebody said, well, we need to receive Christ. Billy Graham says that. That's good, but the New Testament beat him to it. The Bible talks about receiving Him. Yes, sir. Do I believe we received Christ? Somebody said, yeah, but you know, they received Christ. They didn't receive a pattern. No, folks, listen. As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in Him. Colossians 2.6. Now look at Paul in 1 Thessalonians 2.13. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing. Because when you received the word of God which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. Did they receive Christ? Yes, they received the word when they received Christ. When they received the word, then they received Christ. That's the truth. Well, somebody said, look, we need to teach people about abiding in the person. And there are those that are arguing saying, well, we talk about abiding in the doctrine. And he said, we need to talk more about abiding in a person. It's a distinction without a difference. That's what it is. Let's read about abiding in the person. Get your Bible. I challenge you. Get your Bible. Shall we abide in that person? Get your Bible. Keep you from going to sleep. Alright? Abide in me. And I in you, as the branch cannot abide, cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine, no more can he except you abide in me. Verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me, the same bringeth forth much fruit. And he that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. Now verse 6, if a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them, cast them in the fire, and they're, bur and they're burned. You look at verse 6. It says, if a man abide not in me, listen, Baptist doctrine, he is, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. Baptist doctrine says he never was saved to begin with. But folks, you can't wither if you didn't have life. That branch was a living branch and he withered. He couldn't have withered if he'd always been dead. All right, now what did Jesus say? Jesus said, abide in me. Somebody said, Larry, that's all we're saying. You ought to talk about abiding in the person. But what do you talk about in the church of Christ? You folks talk about in, in the church today, you're all always talking about abiding in a pattern. You know, no human organizations, no sponsoring churches. And, and I believe all that's essential, Larry, but you all just stress this pattern stuff too much. Let's just tell people to abide in a living person. Well, the same fellow that, that penned these words in John 15 wrote these in 1 John 2. You there? Now, there's no doubt about it, we're to abide in the person. But look at 1 John 2, 24. Let that therefore abide in you. What? Which ye have heard from the beginning. If that which you have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, you also shall continue in the Son and in the Father. Now wait. Jesus said, you continue in me and you'll have life. John says, if you want to continue in the Christ, you've got to do what? You've got to let that which you have heard from the beginning abide in you. That's how you continue in the Christ. What is the thing they'd heard? Look at the next to the last line of verse 14. What was it in 1 John 2, 14 that abided in them? 
the word of God abideth in you. Alright, if the word of God abides in you, the pattern, then if that word abides in you, then you continue in the person. But if this pattern doesn't abide in you, then you can abide in the person. Folks, think about that. I'm telling you. But you're going to hear people say, Now Larry, we got no disagreement with the doctrine you preach. But you need to stress more of this person. John said, look, you can't abide in the person unless this pattern abides in you. That's what he's saying. You see that? Alright, now, how elastic is the gospel? How elastic is it? And I want to know, brethren, I, I would like you to tell me. Do I preach there's one body and one spirit? One hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God? Or I mean, will you tell me how elastic you want it? Is there anybody here that wants me to elasticize and plasticize this thing? To stretch it this much. Anybody want to do that? No, folks. Nobody wants to do that. None of you want to do that. Well, what is this unity. It's the unity of the Spirit. There is one body, one relationship that we have in Christ. There is one Spirit, one animating life-giving Spirit of life in Christ Jesus. There is one hope, one eternal destiny, the hope laid up for you in the word of the truth of the gospel. There's one Lord, one divine authority who has all authority. There is one faith, one divine revelation, the faith once delivered. There is one baptism, one plan of pardon and forgiveness and fellowship in the Lord. And there is one God, one object of our worship. One Lord and Him only shall we serve. Now let's break these down and look at them. Next. What is the one body? The one body is the one church. Jesus said, I'll build my church. He's the head over all things to the church, which is His body, and He's the head of the body of the church. The body is the church, the church is the body, they're just one. Now folks, when you become ashamed of that, then you apologize for gospel preachers who will preach it. And when you as a preacher become ashamed of it, you quit preaching it. I want to know how long has it been since where you attend, y'all have had a meeting where the sermon one night was entitled The One True Church, or something like that. We're not having that kind of preaching anymore, brethren. And why is it? Because brethren are embarrassed by it and preachers may be ashamed of it. That's not an allegation or an indictment. I'm asking. How is it, brethren? There is only in e one body. There's one spirit, one life. Paul said, the law, of the, li the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. Now listen. The law of the Spirit has made me free from the law of sin and death. What makes me free from sin and death? The gospel is God's power into salvation. So the law of the Spirit of Romans 8.2 is the gospel of Christ that makes me free from the rule or the law of sin and death. And by the one Spirit we have that life through the gospel. Now, look at Ephesians 2.18. Speaking of Christ, for through Him, Christ, we both, you and Gentile, have access by one Father... By one Spirit unto the Father. Alright? By Christ, by one Spirit unto the Father. By one Spirit we have access. But you know Ephesians 3, 6 says we have access by the Gospel. So by the Spirit equals by the Gospel. Now that's the thought. There ain't any way around that. The Gentiles are fellow heirs, partaker of His promise in Christ, by the Gospel. Now get it please. We have access to the Father by one Spirit. But Ephesians 3, 6 says, by the gospel. See that? There's one spirit, one life-giving, animating spirit. There's one hope. Jehovah's Witnesses, folks, have two hopes. One on a re redeemed earth and one 144,000 in heaven. Paul said, the hope. Peter said, for the hope, the living hope, imperishable, immortal, eternal. He said, this hope, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ which according to His abundant mercy hath begotten us again into a living or a lively hope 
by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away reserved in heaven for you. There's just one hope and that's the hope of heaven. One eternal destiny. Not anything on the earth. And when a Jehovah's Witnesses tell you that there's something on the earth for you, he's telling you a lie. There's one hope. Next. But there's one Lord, one divine authority. The mighty power of God that He wrought or worked in Christ when He raised Him from the dead and set Him at His own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. Who is gone into heaven is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and principalities and powers being made subject to Him. One Lord, one authority. Doesn't leave the Pope of Rome any authority. Doesn't leave the local church any authority to determine or decide what the truth is. And I guess Harry will tell us which way that is tomorrow morning. Okay? There's one faith. The Bible says one faith, one gospel. Listen to Acts 6 7. And the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied, listen, in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. But what do we obey? 2 Thessalonians 1.8 We obey the gospel. We obey the truth. 1 Peter 1.22 So the truth, the gospel, is the faith. Acts 6.7 Listen to what Galatians 1.11 says. Paul said, I certify, I guarantee you, brethren, that the gospel which is preached of me is not after man, for neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. What did you get, Paul? The gospel preached of me. But in Galatians 1.23, he said he preached the faith, which once he destroyed. The faith is the one faith, the one gospel that we're learning to slick and for. One baptism, one law of pardon. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Repentance and baptism in the name of Christ for the remission of sins. Now, you say everybody believes there's one baptism. No, they don't. Pentecostals have two, and generally three baptisms. Now let me tell you how easy this is. You say, well, how do we know which one? Water baptism or Holy Ghost baptism? Here's how it is. Listen. Do you remember 1 Corinthians 10 says they were all baptized under Moses in the cloud and in the sea? you remember that? All right, now, when the wall of water there and the cloud above them, they were there delivered, overwhelmed with the water, delivered in the hand from the shackles and servitude of Egyptian bondage. They were delivered unto Moses. And Exodus 14 says, God saved Israel that day. Now, that was the baptism of Moses, and once they got free of Egypt, that baptism, so to speak, ceased. Now, come down with me through the corridors of time. Suppose there's a fellow in Isaiah's day who looks back some 700 years, and he says, Whoo, I, I see that baptism of Moses way back down at the Red Sea. And suppose a guy in Isaiah's day says, I want the baptism of Moses. I want the baptism of Moses. Well, Isaiah would have said, Well, fella, that fulfilled his purpose when he came out of Egypt. You can't have the baptism of Moses anymore. It fulfilled its purpose. So when it fulfilled its purpose, listen, when that baptism fulfilled its purpose, the baptism of Moses ceased. Right now, Holy Ghost baptism, listen, in part was to guide men into all truth. Convince the Jews that the Gentiles were gospel subjects. When that was accomplished, that baptism ceased. A fellow in Isaiah's day couldn't get the baptism of Moses. And a fellow in our day can't get the baptism of the Holy Ghost. There's just one left. What is that one? As long as men need to be saved, it's the one that's in water. See? Now that's, that's the answer to that. That's the truth. And there's one God, one object of our worship, and Him only shalt thou serve. Now, say, well, Larry, isn't there any variety? Why, sure. Listen. There isn't any variety in that we're buried in baptism. But you know you might be buried face forward or backwards. And it doesn't matter if I baptize you, your daddy does. I've had young folks come up and I ask a father, do you, you want to baptize your son? And he looks at me kind of shocked and he thinks, well, yeah. Well, does that matter? Of course not. There's some variety. Whether or not you have a running stream outside or a pool indoors, that doesn't make any difference. We have variety. There's no variety in the immersion. Now, first day of the week communion, 
I once worshiped with the church when we took the Lord's Supper Sunday afternoon at 3 o'clock. What about that? Why, sure. We could do it in an upper room at night, sit or stand. I understand that in some countries they stand around the Lord's table and take it. Is that all right? Sure. As long as what? As long, listen, as long as you take it on the first day of the week. See that? Now, somebody said, well, if you can have that variety, then can we sprinkle? Now, this is where the rub comes in. Scoot this up just a little, just a tad. Right there. Somebody said, well, Larry, if you allow this, why can't you allow sprinkling and taking the Lord's Supper on Friday? Here's why, folks. Get it. Sprinkling is not immersion. And Friday is not upon the first day of the week. And we're to hold the traditions which we have been taught by the apostles, Acts 2.42. Those things don't fit. And we can't go outside the doctrine of Christ. So we can have variety whether we take the Lord's Supper in an upper room or in a basement. But we can't have any variety taking it on Friday. That's not the first day. Sprinkle, that's not immersion. But see, if I, take, if I baptize somebody sideways or backwards, I've still done what? I've still baptized. See? Next. Well, Larry, isn't there any elasticity in what you preach? Listen, elders are not to be soon angry and apt to teach. Now, there are degrees of ability in an eldership. We've got three elders. Norris, Archie, and Ted. Somebody said, Larry, which one is the ablest teacher? Not on your life. <laughs> I don't preach for Philly Luker's sake, but I'm not an idiot. <laughs> now, now listen, there isn't any doubt. There's no variety. None of them can be soon to anger. Now, of our three elders, one of them may be sooner to anger than another, but none of them are soon to anger. They're all able to teach, but is one a better teacher than the other? Depends on who you talk to. You see, there are degrees of ability within that eldership, but there's no denying the fact that they're all qualified. What about our growth? We're all to grow. And some of us, Matthew 13, bring 30 bushels an acre. Some of us bring 60. Some bring 100. And some like me maybe bring 5 or 10. But what? The Lord says grow. Now there, there's the fact. We're all to grow. Now we might not all grow at the same level. Well, somebody said, well, then because of that, you have a little variety in your growth. Could you have a little variety in your drunkenness? No, because if you're a little drunk, you're still drunk. If you tell a white lie, you still told a lie. See, you steal the stick of gum, you still been guilty of stealing. Okay? Next. But somebody said, Larry, we don't divide over everything. That's right. Here's why. Now look, I have a son that is in Chattanooga, Tennessee today taking a test for a police academy. I don't know what job he will accept. And I knew a preacher in Parkersburg, West Virginia, Brother C.D. Plum's son, Charles, who was chief of police in Parkersburg, West Virginia, been preached every Sunday. That doesn't prove anything. But there are those who say, well, I could never be a policeman. Yes, there are some differences here, but everybody agrees, both my son and the fellow that says he could never be a policeman, all agree, thou shalt not kill, and that murder is a sin. No one is trying to circumvent God's law in that. Well, somebody said we disagree on the covering. That's right. But the woman who doesn't wear a covering is not saying, my wife is not saying she's not in subjection. She believes that principle of headship and subjection as strongly as do you. We're not denying that principle. In every church where I've lived in four states, someone has been of the mind that they wouldn't even celebrate Christmas in their home with giving of gifts at that holiday season. Now, I may not personally concur with that, but I respect that view. And I've never had one second's trouble with anyone over it. Because everybody agrees that we can't bind human traditions in our worship. I will just say this. 
I never thought that an alien who shot a firecracker on July 4th was a citizen of the United States because he did it. I never thought a Jew who had a Christmas tree in his house suddenly believed in Jesus Christ. Those are my views. But I respect the person who says, I don't want any part of that tradition. Well, how can we both get along? Don't some differences not divide, Brother Hayflin? That's right. Because we all agree that we are to hold in our worship to God Almighty the traditions of God and not the traditions of men. Some that are not conscientiously able to separate the social from the spiritual have that prerogative and that right. Well, somebody said, I don't want to ever, ever have a funeral in a church building. Well, why doesn't that divide us? Because those that die, we're not going to have your funeral here. But how would you know? We're not going to do that. We're not going to have a funeral. Well, why is it? Why, why is it we get along in that regard? Because we all agree it's the church's duty to preach the gospel and not be in the funeral business. We all agree on that. And so whether you want to have a funeral here with your body present, and, or do not want to, we still agree on this basic premise. We're not varying from that. Well, you say there's some women that don't comment in class, and some do. There's disagreement there. Yes, that's right. We have a disagreement about whether a woman might make a comment in a private Bible class. But you know all those women agree that none of them can teach over the man. My wife very rarely will make a comment in class. Very rarely. But she does at times. Now then, Maybe you say, but my wife would never make a comment. You say, well, there's a difference there. Yes, but the thing is, the principle is not violated. Neither woman believes that they can teach over the man. The principle remains inviolate. And there are those that are working very hard and that appreciate a college run by Christians. And there are those that don't want a reference to such things made. And I can understand and appreciate conviction. Well, how do we get along? We get along because all agree. Those that support and endorse brethren who want to teach and want to work at a, at a college institution operated by brethren, both understand the church is not to be involved in the support of the work of that college. And so whatever might be our conscientious scruples, we don't divide over that next. But can the same be said for social drinking, for divorce and remarriage, for homosexuality, for women preachers, for music and worship? Can we say that here we can allow the person to divorce and remarry at will? Uh, up, up, it's up to him to decide to make that conscientious determination? No, not according to Matthew 19. Can we just let a person decide whether he shall have a homosexual relationship or not? No. Paul said those that do such things shall not inherit the kingdom. And no, we cannot allow a woman to teach or usurp authority over the man. No, folks, these things do not fit. Next. Now the truth is, one may marry. Paul said marriage is to be held in honor by all in the bed undefiled. And you and I may differ over whether I do so or not. You may choose never to marry. And, and I may say, I don't see how that you can choose never to marry. I, I always want to be married. Well, we may differ over whether we marry or not. But there's one thing we can't do. We can't lose God's marital law. Further, a woman cannot teach over the man. She cannot do that. Now, our wives may differ as to whether one believes they can make a comment in a Bible class. But while we may differ there, this principle remains. We cannot allow the woman to preach as I am doing. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. No woman could do that. And we may have a difference about a private comment in a Bible class. But folks, we both agree that she cannot do as I am doing. Circumcision is not bound 
Circumcision is nothing. Uncircumcision is nothing. But the keeping of the commandments of God, we cannot make it necessary. Acts 15, 1. Or else we subvert souls. Acts 15, 24. Now we may differ. I had both of my children, my boys, circumcised as, as, as babies when they were born. But your son may not have been circumcised. Well, that is all right. Paul says it doesn't make any difference. If you're not circumcised, don't seek to be. It is fine. There is no problem. There's just no problem with that. But I cannot bind circumcision, Galatians 2. Will the elastic gospel stretch? No, it didn't stretch to do that. You see the difference, folks? Now, the truth is, I may eat meat. And you, we may differ. You may say I'm a vegetarian. Well, that is fine. But I cannot bind my view. Because God doesn't care whether I eat meat or whether I don't eat. It doesn't amount to anything, God said. Whether you do or whether you don't. And I can't be a stumbling block to my brother in those areas by my judgment. Next. Now, there are those that are saying, though, but... Listen to this, folks. Listen to this language. This is what we're talking about. Many of us grew up believing God is just a heavenly prosecutor who winces with pain and anger when Christians veer one iota from some supposed... I italicize that. Now look at it. He said, we used to think that God, uh, you know, He really was upset from some supposed exact pattern of worship. You get that little snide thing there? Some supposed exact pattern? He said, followers of Jesus who are attentive to the winds of renewal believe in a God who is our defender. They believe that if He grants grace with moral imperfections, He'll surely offer grace with doctrinal imperfections as well. And that's in the August 1992 issue of Wineskins. Next. Let's look at that. Break it down. Uh, there wasn't one before it. But if there, if there isn't... Okay, go ahead. No, that's right. Yeah, that, that, get that other one first. You, you were right, Norris. Some supposed exact pattern. There's two or three like that, Norris. You made a... Okay. I want to know, folks. He said some supposed... Listen, did I just dream this up, charge some that teach no other doctrine? Is that some supposed exact pattern? Mark them which cause divisions, offenses, contrary to the doctrine you've learned. Is that some supposed pattern? That if you preach any other gospel, then let you be accursed? Does that sound like a supposed exact pattern? Okay, no, another one of those exact pattern charts, though. You laid it down, I think, too. On the floor. Does this sound like a supposed exact pattern? Make all things according to the pattern, whatever you do in word or deed, not to think above men. Hold fast the traditions which you've been taught, whether by word or our epistle. Hold fast the form, the mold, the pattern of sound words. Now listen to me. Does that, folks, sound like a supposed exact pattern? Don't, don't go outside or beyond the doctrine of Christ. Is that a supposed exact pattern? Uh, there isn't one, another one of those? Okay, give me that one then. That's fine. And then, notice he said... Followers of Jesus believe that if He grants grace with moral imperfections, He'll surely offer grace for doctrinal imperfections. And what this simply says is, well, you know, if we, if we disagree on marriage, divorce, and remarriage, and what constitutes adultery, we believe God will grant grace with regard to it. Well, all right, if He will, let's just expand that to homosexual. How about drunkenness? How about nude beaches? And if He grants... If he grants grace with moral imperfections and allows that adultery when someone misunderstands whether or not what adultery is, if God grants grace and allows that, and he, will he offer grace for doctrinal imperfections? What about instrumental music? Shall we apologize to the Christian church? Shall we apologize to the denominations for the pastor, the Christmas, the Easter, and the sprinkling? Will God grant grace? You say, oh, the only one I want out of here to get a little grace in is this one right here. Yeah, that's the one you want, but your grandkids are going to take the whole ball of wax. Mark that down. Next. <coughs> Max Licato is a famous author. Famous writer. And in Wineskins, he said, 
I have, listen to this, brother. I have brothers with whom I do not agree on the role of women and the meaning of baptism. But listen to what he says about that. Now, we disagree on the role of women, the meaning of baptism. Listen. But he said, our uncommon ground on those issues is a barren island compared to the great continent of common ground we share. If we can agree on the Christ, don't we share enough to accept one another? Now, folks, that's what this Romans 14 perversion and this recognition of those who stretch the truth on marriage, divorce, and remarriage is all about. If, we, if we're in Christ, don't we share enough to accept one another? Listen to what he says. Fellowship is not found in common opinions, like on whether baptism, what baptism is or women's role. It's not found in common opinions, but in a common Savior. You hear that? See what that means? Next. Here's what it means. Now he says he has brethren he disagrees with on the role of women and the meaning of baptism. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But he said those are unimportant opinions. Are you brethren ready to swap out on these and say these are unimportant? Say, no, Larry, we don't want this. How about singing? You want to change this? No, the only one we in Churches of Christ want is this little one right down here, this little corner. Our little corner here, we want this misunderstanding of putting away your wife except it be for fornication. Now, we got all kinds of differences there. And Brother Hayfley, we just want this little corner. Let's just cut this little corner out right here, and that's ours. And Brother Licato, he, he can have those. We know those are wrong. You see where we're headed? See, you want just this one right here. You want divergency. You want difference. You want contradictory teachings because of the common continent in Christ. But Max Licato wants these two up here. You say, no! No, Brother Hayfler! I'd never go that far. But your grandchildren will. Your grandchildren will, Mike. That's what we're talking about. All right. Now, where's all this lead? In conclusion. Seven months ago, Rubel Shelley said, the Woodmont Hills Church of Christ in Nashville, Tennessee, community-wide service, Sunday evening, April 10th, 1994. Quote, at 7 p.m. on Sunday, April 10th, Members from at least seven churches in the Green Hills area plan to meet for a community post-Easter worship service. Now stop right there. Are you all with me? When he said seven churches, and you say, well, what's wrong with seven churches getting together? I didn't tell you, and he didn't either, that these were Methodist, Baptist, Presbyterian, and Christian churches. More than one Baptist. More than one Christian church. So there were churches of Christ, Christian church, Methodist church, Baptist church, Presbyterian church, seven in all. We're all getting together in the Green Hills area to plan to meet for a community post-Easter worship service. Rubel Shelley said, we have all our regular services on that day. Then all who care to participate can assemble in the main auditorium of the Woodmont Christian Church for a one-hour assembly. Special music. Are you ready, brethren? Why did he say special music if he just meant singing? Because he meant special music. Special music will be provided by children's choirs and adult groups. What is that, brother? Biblical texts will be read. I wonder if making melody in your heart and psalms, hymns, spiritual songs would be one of those texts to be read. Do you? I doubt it. And prayers will be said. Listen, there will be a sermon dealing with the meaning of the resurrection. I've been asked to present, present that sermon. Now, folks, that's where it goes. Now, I want to tell you something. Rubel Shelley was one of the most conservative men in the institutional camp. 
even 15 years ago. This is where it leads, brethren. Finally, and last of all. Just 14 months ago, and folks, this isn't a chart, this is a photographic reproduction of a newspaper. The Florence Times in Florence, Alabama, Stanley Clark on the left, Minister Northwoods United Methodist Church, and Joe Van Dyke, Minister Magnolia Church of Christ, prior to joint service, historic event, Florence, Alabama, Church of Christ, Methodist Church, hold joint meeting Sunday night. Do you think, my friends, that Brother Van Dyke that night talked about buried with him in baptism and condemned sprinkling? Do you think Brother Van Dyke said, and the disciples were called Christians, not Methodists, first at Antioch? No! Now, Twenty years ago, folks, I was writing newspaper articles every week for six years in that same paper. And the liberals sent back articles with my picture, horns drawn on it. Pitchfork, can you imagine that? Me with horns. Sweet, nice, soft, cuddly, fuzzy little me. Now, 20 years later, 15 years later after I left that, 14 years since I left, here's what happened. They didn't think it would either, but brother, I want to tell you something. Some of you, Keith Sharp, Brother Donahue, y'all have got children, grandchildren coming. And if we don't hew to the line, there's Kevin and his children, Clinton and his children, if we don't hew to the line, as unthinkable as it was in the early 80s and late 70s, here's what happened in 1993. Now folks, let me tell you what's, what might happen just after the turn of the century. Some of y'all that got kids now just entering high school turn of the century, those children are going to be married. And ten years from now, those ones that just entering high school are going to be having your grandchildren. Where are they going to be if you don't stand for the truth? Brethren, you've listened patiently and you've listened well. And I do not apologize for anything but semi-apologize perhaps for length. But this is too important, brethren, for us to draw back, to scale back, to scale down. You say, but Larry, no one is contending for some of these liberal things you're talking about. Folks, nobody starts out that way. Nobody starts out contending for them. I'm saying that the signs and the seeds that Tom Roberts talked about last night and the things that we touched on tonight are being sown today. And this is where they inevitably lead. I beg of you elders and preachers, Bible class teachers, all of you grandmothers, grandfathers, that you instill, install, and instruct your children in the name of the Lord, in the word of the Lord, and in the truth of the gospel. That you might be able to hold fast that one faith. That they might be able to continue in the truth. Anchored, grounded, steadfast. And be not moved away from the hope of the gospel. I pray that will be your aim. Some great and grand and glorious day, my friend. The Lord Jesus Christ is going to descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of the archangel. And with the trump of God. Some great day, the last wave will spend itself upon the last seashore. Someday the last beam and last ray of light will have sped its way to beam and warm the heart of Mother Earth. Someday the moon and the stars will go out in a cataclysmic display of death, of blackness and darkness forever and ever. Some great and grand and glorious day the dead in Christ will rise. We that are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air. Some great and grand and glorious and glad day, the Son of God will gather all the ransom redeemed, the reconciled, the righteous of all the earth, under His eternal bosom. There He'll take them down the hallway of eternity, through the pearly portals of an everlasting paradise. And there they'll bask in the bosom of His sunlight, His love, and His life forever and ever. Will you be in that number? If not, my friend, we bid you tonight.
upon the platter of the gospel, we extend the terms of obedience and salvation by the blood of the Lamb. We pray that tonight, this will be the time with faith in your heart, with repentance in your mind, with confession in your lips, that you bow at the feet of King Jesus, be submissive to Him, buried in baptism, raised to walk in newness of life. And if you've done that and straight away and turned away, we bid you tonight to repent or perish. We bid you tonight to come and reclaim the redemption that is in the Redeemer, the salvation, the feast that is ready and prepared. We bid you arise with all enthusiasm, with all desire, with all sincerity of purpose, and obey the truth tonight while we stand and while we sing.